Hello and welcome to Bible Smack. Alright, so today I am responding to uh, probably about an hour and 20 minute lecture. I'm going to try to wrap it up in 15 minutes, so <laughs> we'll see how that goes. But uh, by Steve Anderson, kind of uh, uh, going over uh, dispensationalism and, uh, you know, basically accusing all of those of us who hold to some form of dispensation as uh, false teachers and you know, heretics and all that kind of stuff. So, um, basically, um, how do you define dispensationalism? Um, I would encourage people, if they were, were students of church history, to check out the Niagara Conference. Uh, go look that up. Um, it's where a great deal of uh, ministers came together and searched the scriptures and came up with this conclusion. Um, that was back in the uh, late 1800s, but... Uh, basically, uh, he's going to pick out, you know, his, you know, certain dispensational teachers, especially Schofield, you know, Schofield's automatically supposed to be the Pope because he made a popular study Bible. Well, I got, I got a popular study Bible. This is Tim Hayes. okay, I've, I've heard that he's supposed to be a dispensationalist. And, you know, when you get to these theological camps, it's not like I'm endorsing every single person who believes this, that, and the other, Okay. Uh, but there's an article here called Dispensations by Robert Dean Jr. He's going to define it for us. He says, Dispensationalism is the interpretive key that unlocks pages of Scripture, opens the door for our understanding of prophecy, and orients our thinking about God's blueprint of, for human history. The complementary principles form the foundation of dispensational theology. The first principle states that, so we've got three principles here. First, states that the Bible must be consistently understood in terms of the plain, literal meaning of words, okay, including the use of figures of speech where the context indicates. Second, a second principle lies in the premise that God has a plan for ethnic national Israel, and that is distinct from his plan for the New Testament church. Okay. The third principle is that Dispensationalism is that human history is the outworking of an internal plan of God that culminates in the bringing maximum glory to himself. Okay, So if you believe that God is working through these different periods to bring you know, ultimate glory to God, if you believe that Israel is not exactly the same as the church, okay, or not the same as the church, I should say, they're distinct, if you believe that we should take the Bible literally, take it to according to its context, but take it literally, all the words have meaning, okay? Well, then you're one of these evil dispensationalists. And basically, um, what he says is that the key teaching, okay? Now, as I read, that's, that's how they defined it, but um, the key teaching really is that they believe that Jews had a second... Uh, way of salvation that um, the Jews had a different way of salvation than we do that they would work their way to heaven in the Old Testament and that now we're by grace oh no alright um, no <laughs> um, that you could pick a couple very early guys who may have said something here or said something there but if you're talking about the camp, if you're talking about what everybody's teaching, you know, look, look, look what this thing says. Salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone. Alone. Okay. That's, that's just what it says. Now, it's kind of funny to me because in his little speech, probably around minute 20, I think there's something else that was going on in minute 39, he starts talking about how, like, the men in the Old Testament were saved exactly the same way that we're saved today. That they were saved right there, dead on the spot. Okay. Um, I don't really find that in the Bible. And you can look at it and, you know, see when uh, Abraham, you know, accepted Jesus. And he said, Jesus is my Lord. And he said that... Um, you know, he's going to get baptized and everything like that. Um, not seeing it, okay? It just, 
it, you, you got to actually go with what the Bible is actually saying. Okay. Uh, let's look at Hebrews 11 real quick. Hebrews 11, it says, um, verse, uh, I think I'm going to go with verse 39. And these all, and that's like a whole chapter of Old Testament saints and stuff like that, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that without us should not be made perfect. Okay? They had to wait until the resurrection of Christ. It also says something over here in 1 Corinthians 15. This might go longer, 15 minutes. But <laughs> I'm trying, people. Alright. Let's see if I can find it. It says, uh, 1523, But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, is he the 400th fruits? Well, he's the first fruits of the resurrection. Now, if you're in the Old Testament, then, you know, they're not saying the name of Jesus. Okay? They had Joshua in there. I think they had a Yeshua. But, you know, you don't see the name Jesus. And basically... They're not believing in Jesus. I mean, they'll say, well, they're looking too forward to the Messiah. Hopefully. I hope they got it all down, but it's not necessarily the case. And if you could, show me the verse that says that we are all looking forward to the Messiah to get to heaven. Actually, it's not really talking a whole lot about that. When you talk to Jewish theologians and stuff, they're going to kind of argue that maybe there's not a heaven. I mean, they may not all of them, don't get me wrong, but... A lot of them, you know, they kind of think, well, there's going to be a resurrection. Especially when you talk to Jewish or Judaizing Christians. They're, they'd say, okay, we're under the law, and the law says that there is no afterlife, there's just the resurrection, so our souls are going to sleep. Okay, Why are they making a big deal? Because the Old Testament is not really concerned about the salvation, heaven, and hell. That would, be, that would have to be something that would wait. What did Jesus say when he died on the cross? It is finished. Sounds like there was a period where it wasn't finished. Okay. What happened to the dead? All right, well, Book of Luke points this out. He never looks at the Book of Luke for some reason. Maybe he's not aware of it. You know, but... Um, He's got to be aware of it because he kind of mentions something where it's like, nowhere in the Bible does it say this, and nowhere in the Bible does it say that. So you got to know the whole Bible, right? So he, he's got to know this already. Story of the rich man Lazarus. He said, There's a rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen uh, and fared sumptuously, and there's a certain beggar which was laid at the gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked the sores. And um, it says, It came to pass that the beggar died, and he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man was also, also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water. I'm going to skip down. It's torment and flight. It says, But Abraham uh, said, Son, remember that in thy lifetime receives the gospel, sorry, receive the good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he's comforted and thou art tormented. Besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf. So you got these two areas, and a great gulf. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us. That would come from thence. And let's see here. I'm going to go skip a little bit because we just don't have a lot of time, but 19 through 31, it's all there. So basically, this is kind of what you have in the afterlife. 
But then we see something kind of happen. In Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, it says in verse, um, say, uh, 50. Jesus, let's say he's on the cross, when he had cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the haunt, horns honked, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose. That was a joke, by the way, about the horns. <laughs> he says, you know, all of a sudden you had this earthquake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were open, and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared in a minute after the resurrection. Um... You know, Jesus saves. If he doesn't save, what do you got? You got people who vaguely believe in God. And, you know, Steve Anderson said this is his gospel. He said he believed this when he was a little boy. He said, you know, they believed in God. They didn't know much about Jesus. But, um, you know, that was about it, really. So, you know... Is that and they didn't even know they were saved, okay? I don't even know if they knew much about heaven at that point. All right, you, you go back to the old covenant. What's the old covenant talking about anyway? He says, "Choose you this day whom you will serve." No, hold on, that's Joshua. I'm getting there. Thirty. I'm gonna say ten. And it says, let's see here, verse 15, we'll go to that. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, walk in his ways, and keep his commandments and statutes. And thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land, whether thou goest to possess it. Law is about this life, okay? You choose to do good. You could choose to do bad, okay? That's this life, that's this, you know, system of morality and all that kind of stuff. It is not talking about salvation. Salvation came later when Jesus died on the cross. He set the captives free. I think I can find that. I think it's in Revelation 1. says in 118, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Okay, he holds the keys. But, early in Hebrews, said something a little different. It says, um, make sure I found it. Uh, 2.14, for as much then as the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same. Through death he might destroy him. They had the power of death, that is the devil. Okay, so basically, before the devil had the power, and then after the resurrection, Christ had the power, he holds the keys. Okay, so he has saved those people. They have come, they've been resurrected, they've come in the glory. And also, that temple... Okay, the temple is a sign of the things in heaven. And let's see here, I know you got pieces of this in nine and ten. Um, it says the very first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. 
there's a tabernacle made during the first. And um, basically, um, all this stuff is symbolic of what's going on in heaven. So in heaven, you get the holiest of holy places, but then you also had this realm where it was like it was a holy place and one there. What's that? It's the bosom of Abraham. And so basically now, all of a sudden, now Jesus saves. Okay? He saves in a space, in a time, through his resurrection. What did he say? Here's another sign of that. Because, like, you know, he went to paradise. He, he said to the thief on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise. And that's one of Steve's big key words there. He's like, Aha, you see, you're talking about paradise. But. Then he's talking to Mary Magdalene, and he says, don't touch me, okay? I think this is somewhere in John. I'm just going to speed it up a little bit, but basically you can go find that in John. And so he says, you know, don't touch me. I've not yet ascended to the Father, all right? So basically, um, Jesus had not yet been glorified in heaven. Um, he was waiting until he ascended to heaven. And what that means is, it goes back to this fundamental fact, salvation didn't happen until Jesus came. Now, there's another issue, and he decided to bring up the whole thing about the sons of God in Genesis 6. <coughs> he said, sons of God, never ever, I mean, you watch the tape, sons of God never refers to... Um, Angels. Okay. That's his premise because in Genesis 6, the angels come down, marry man, yada yada. Well, let's see here. Right. Uh -huh. Okay. It says, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut up the sea with doors and break it forth as issued out of the room? It says the, the sons of God uh, shouted for joy when the morning stars sang at the foundations of the earth. When, you know, when did that happen? When was the foundations of the earth established? It was in the creation week. Well, that was before there were people. You know, so the people happened at the end. So basically, that had to be angels. It just, it is what it is. And uh, then you see at the beginning of Job, we're talking about it, uh, where the sons of God have all come up to see God, and there's, uh, there's Satan. So basically, um, the angels are judged. We see a little bit of that more here in First Peter 3 real quick. And he also, he says that was like, you know, only dispensationalists teach that, which was false. Uh, I've heard Reformed people teach it. I've heard uh, Catholic people teach it. You know, Tertullian taught it. So, you know, whatever. But, let's see here. This is some Peter. Three seventeen. It says um, eighteen. For Christ also hath suffered once for the sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which he also went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient. 
when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure, whereupon even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of flesh, in other words, not the physical washing, but the answer of a good consciousness towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the power of salvation is in the resurrection. They had to wait for the resurrection. Okay, the resurrection was a physical act. All right, so if it's a physical act, it's in space and time, it's not the past. All right. Um, as I said earlier, from um, that was Job. I think it was. Um, make sure I get it because he said nowhere in the Bible was the sons of God ever he made a big old deal about it. He's like, nowhere in the Bible is the gun. In the Bible, is the sons of God ever mentioned as angels? And I had to look through the Old Testament and went through Strong's Concordance to find this out. And let's see here. It's 38. Job 38, verse 6 through 7. Okay, so you can go take that, read that home. And basically, um, you know, you have to study the word to show yourself approved. You know, anybody can come on here and say, oh, so-and-so's a heretic, blah, 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 blah. Well, you know what you got to do? You got to be a Berean. You got to show me. You got to read this stuff. Uh, that guy, he, you know, he's taught some good things. He's taught some good things about the nature of the church. He's talked about the, uh, the Great Whore of Babylon. Uh, I've heard him talk about uh, the King James Bible. You know, there's some good stuff. But you know what? That just makes it worse because he's gonna he's gonna teach people some Bible and then he's gonna twist it a little later. You know you can't just sit there and say, okay, preacher, show me the way. All right, unless you're talking to me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but actually, what it is is that you gotta study the Word, show yourself approved, so that you can get it directly from God. 